Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion uh, 4441 in the name of Jackie Bailey on supporting carers during the cost of living crisis. I would invite members who wish to participate in the debate to press the request speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Jackie Bailey to speak and to move the motion uh, for around six minutes. Ms. Bailey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity to bring forward this debate. There is no doubt that we are facing a cost of living crisis, the likes of which we have not experienced in a generation. Inflation has risen to 9% over the last six months and will be at least 10% by the end of the year. Economists are forecasting a recession. So things are tough and they're going to get tougher still. During the pandemic, unpaid carers and social care workers stepped up to the plate. They shouldered an enormous burden as they kept loved ones safe. And they are still carrying that responsibility as services have not fully resumed. Pre-pandemic, too many carers experienced poverty and the problem is now much worse. Carers Scotland found that more than half of unpaid carers are currently unable to afford their monthly expenses and their financial situation has worsened in the last six months. Carers have also seen an increase in the cost of products and services they need for the person they're caring for. Everything from PPE to incontinence pads to medical equipment, all of it has gone up. 87% think that they will not be able to heat their home to a safe level and 41% are worried they will have to use a food bank. And the overwhelming majority are worried about the impact on their mental and physical health with the additional stress and anxiety that the cost of living is causing. If we value carers as we say we do, then we must not allow this to continue. The time to act is now. It is no longer good enough to simply blame the UK Tory government and wring your hands. The Scottish government also has a responsibility to act. Talking to carers this morning from across Scotland, they said to me, crumbs on the table are no longer enough. Unpaid carers saved the government £43 million a day and without us, the system would collapse. The carers' allowance supplement is wiped out by hidden costs like laundry, and there is no recognition of this. We are constantly having to fight, and this must stop. Scottish Labour has set out many times the action that this SNP government can take. Ending non-residential care charges, something that both Scottish Labour and the SNP committed to in their manifestos, but it should be done now. That will make an instant difference to the money people have in their pockets. Increasing access to the welfare fund for unpaid carers, making carers' responsibilities a qualifying criteria for grants. Keeping the carers' allowance supplement at the enhanced rate. Developing additional financial support for households with disabled people to meet what we know will be increased costs of energy because they are higher for them than for the general population, and implementing a strategy for unpaid carers. I know there is one coming, but please let it include action on poverty, on the restoration and expansion of respite services, with entitlements to short breaks and wellbeing services. That's five simple things we've suggested that the Scottish Government could do now if they wanted to. They have the power to act. The responsibility is theirs. Let me turn to social care staff. I met with Shona, Samantha, Shirley and Val this morning. They're care workers from across Scotland. They tell me we are so understaffed that we have to cover between 10 and 12 extra visits per week. We work in partnership with the NHS. We care for the same clients. So we simply do not understand why we are treated differently. We're being asked to pay huge amounts on fuel and there is no support in place for us. Some care workers in my constituency are subsidising their employers. They work in the private sector and they get 25 pence per mile. The cost of petrol has skyrocketed and in order to visit their clients, they are spending much more than they are being reimbursed. Whilst NHS staff have rightly received a five pence mileage rate increase, and I welcome that from the government. Social care staff have been left behind once again. And let's also remember, most NHS staff 
start from a position of 45 pence per mile, not 25 pence, as is the experience by some in the care sector. So my question to government is why do they persist in treating social care workers as second-class citizens? They deserve parity of esteem and they deserve the same financial recompense for caring for people. Now, it was only six months ago that the SNP and the Greens rejected Scottish Labour's calls to deliver an immediate pay rise of £12 per hour to social care staff, moving to £15 an hour in the following year. Instead, they opted for a measly 48 pence pay increase. Let's remember this is a predominantly female workforce. It's low paid, and the SNP have paid lip service to them. It cannot be right that retail and hospitality jobs pay so much more than social care. And of course, the Greens used to believe that social care workers deserve £15 an hour. But their principles went out the window for a ministerial Mondeo and a £31,383 pay rise for each of the two Green ministers. That's more than a care worker earns in a year. That is shameful. Social care staff are not immune to the cost of living crisis. We should be exploring every opportunity to help and to retain their skills in the sector. And another suggestion made by the trade unions is for payment of the Scottish Social Services Council registration fee to be paid by the government. A small but important you, you gesture. You need to wind up, Mr. Presiding yeah. officer, let me come to a conclusion. None of this should be a surprise to the SNP government. You don't need to spend months and years deliberating over what to do. You don't need to blame someone else. You can act. You have the power to make a difference. And carers need you to do so now. Thank you, Ms Bailey. I need you to move the motion as well. I move the motion in my name. Many thanks indeed. Uh, I can advise the Chamber we are tight uh, for time, so I will be requiring colleagues to stick to the time allocation. And I call on Kevin Stewart to speak to move amendment at uh, treble 4.1.2, around five minutes. Mr Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Um, and I would like to start by thanking carers, both paid and unpaid, uh, for their remarkable work providing critical and invaluable support to people across Scotland. The Tory cost of living crisis has an impact on everyone in Scotland, uh, and that includes the social care workforce uh, and unpaid carers. Uh, and the Scottish Government has already committed itself to increase spend in social care by 25 per cent by the end of the Parliament to help lay the groundwork for the establishment of a national care services, uh, service. We will take forward these ambitious reforms, uh, but we do not want to wait for NCS to come into being before we take action. Funding of £846.6 million uh, will be transferred from the health portfolio this year to local authorities for a range of investments in health and social care and mental health services. By working in collaboration with our partners, we want to see improvements in recruitment and retention, fair work and ethical commissioning. And we are fully committed to improving the experience of the social care workforce, including increasing levels of pay as we recognise and value the work that they do. Um, I will carry on just now because I have got a lot to go through. Uh, from April this year, uh, we have provided funding of £200 million to local government to support investment in health and social care, embed improved paying conditions and deliver a £10.50 minimum wage for all adult social care staff and commission services from 1 April this year. And I would remind the Chamber that that is more than social care staff are paid south the border and more uh, than social care staff are paid in labour-controlled Wales. And that increase represents an increase of 12.9 per cent over the course of this year. Um, and I'll give way, was it Ms Malkin? Pam oh, Duncan Glancy. Uh, Ms Duncan Glancy. Uh, thank you to the Minister for giving way. Um, what, what would you say to the 51 per cent of local authority staff who earn below £25,000 a year, who are only getting a 2 per cent pay increase, or, or that's what's on the table? 
What would you say to them, many of whom are social carers? Uh, what I would say um, to everyone right across the country at this moment is that we require an emergency budget from the Tory Chancellor to address this cost of living crisis. That is what we need. I would like to see this par Parliament have all of the levers of power to be able to deal with these things. We do not. That is something that the Labour benches do not recognise. For example, uh, giving us powers over employment law would be one thing that would be very, very helpful indeed. Uh, President Officer, uh, we are also working with a Fair Work and Social Care Group who have developed a set of recommendations for minim minimum standards for terms and conditions reflecting fair work principles, an ethical uh, approach to commissioning, and as a consequence to any procurement of care and support, will have massive benefits for staff and supported people alike. We know that there have been some gains already from early adopters and local government, but this approach must be extended and enhanced. And on increasing fuel costs, the Scottish Government do not set the mileage rate to social care staff, as these are agreed by their own employers. 1,200 separate employers, as I have told the Chamber before. The Government is committed to abolishing charges for non-residential social care and support so that the provision of these services are based on a person's need and not their ability to pay. And we are currently working with stakeholders to develop options to achieve this as soon as practical. I will take Dr Gohani. Dr Gohani. Thank you, Minister. Is it not right to say that the private uh, companies are getting squeezed and so the money that they don't have they can't pass on so if that was sorted out then they'd be able to pass on the money minister uh, no i don't think all private companies are getting squeezed at all during the course of this cost of living crisis some companies are making huge profits and why should the why, why should government subsidize private companies in these regards i find it absolutely hypocritical of dr galhani to put forward an amendment which says that this government should find the money to pay for additional fuel costs for people when he is too afraid to say the same thing to his own Chancellor and have an emergency budget now. Presiding <laughs> uh, Officer, we have improved support for Scotland's unpaid carers. I need to crack on. Thank you. Uh, we have improved support for Scotland's unpaid carers as a pr priority. Uh, within our own social security powers. And our carers allowance supplement was the first payment made by Social Security Scotland and increases carers allowance by over 13%, with eligible carers receiving a payment every six months. Uh, and, President Officer, we are doing more. We announced an additional £4 million in January to help organisations working with unpaid carers to put expanded services in place this winter. On top of this, we have invested an additional £20.4 20 million for local carer support in 2022-23, bringing total investment in the Carers Act to £88.4 million this year. And we have also earmarked additional funding for short breaks. And we will bring forward a new carers strategy, uh, which we are working on alongside carers. But, President Officer, I think the key thing in all of this that the UK government needs to play its part to address this cost of living crisis for all of us. Uh, they need to implement an emergency budget now to address the cost of living costs for care workers, uh, for unpaid carers and for society as a whole. Thank you, Minister. I now call on Sandra Gulhani to speak to and move Amendment 4441.1 for five minutes, uh, Dr Gulhani. Thank you. Well, it seems the Minister seems to think that uh, private companies who are providing care to our most vulnerable are making vast amounts of profit, and I would, uh, I would welcome an example. I believe all of us in this chamber recognise that our social care workforce is overwhelmed, and we also acknowledge their immense work. The pandemic exacerbated... Well, I'm sorry, was there something you'd like to say? Michelle Thompson. That, I, I forget the exact name of Robert Kilgour's private uh, care homes, but I think he funds a Tory party to £220,000 a month, so maybe you'd ask him to make a contribution. Through the Chair and Dr Gulhani. Well, I believe that your facts and figures, unlike everything to do with SNP with facts and figures, are all wrong. 
So let's just move on, shall we? The pandemic exacerbated long-standing challenges facing the sector, which has long experienced increasing workloads, burnout and rising sickness levels. Over 200,000 staff work in social care in Scotland, and we know that they are ignored, overstretched, poorly paid, undervalued and, frankly, hamstrung by a lack of effective leadership from this SNP Green government. Recruitment and retention rates are poor, with a quarter of staff leaving within three months of joining an organisation. And let's not forget Scotland's 700,000 vitally important unpaid carers who have seen rest and respite services closed since the COVID pandemic uh, I need to crack on uh, struck. The knock-on impact is increased anxiety, depression and mental health exhaustion. We have a duty to act to get a grip and we need to act today. Of course, there are different views in this chamber on how to tackle the crisis. We support the principles set out in Labour's motion, albeit with some fine-tuning of the words. The SNP Green Government have savagely cut local authority budgets, so the Scottish Government must centrally fund all of Labour's calls. Yes, I would. Julian Martin. Appreciative to Dr Kalhani for taking the intervention. Does he think that the national insurance hike is helping or hindering with regard to the cost of living crisis? Sanders Kulhani. Well, I think, I think what we need to be clear is the increase in the national insurance plus the Barnet consequentials are coming this way to help us here in Scotland. Of course, I, I really do need to, to continue, but I will, if I've got time, come back to you, Minister. So we support the principles set out in Labour's motion and the savage local authority budget cuts that the Scottish Government, so they must centrally fund all of Labour's calls. We also need to ensure allowances for carers are handled efficiently and effectively. And the stats for December show that just 3% of claims were settled within 10 days, while complaints to Social Security Scotland soared by 200% in two years. We're calling for unpaid carers in full-time education to receive the carers' allowance immediately and for unpaid carers to continue receiving carers' allowance for up to six months after bereavement. And as Gillian Martin has said, there's the not-so-small matter of over a billion pound plus coming to the Scottish Government from UK Health and Social Care Levy. This must be passed on in full and there should be a clear audit trail so we can see how this money is spent and enable Audit Scotland to ensure that public money is spent properly I will, yes. Minister. Uh, Dr Gohani could do us all a favour in this place if he would join with me um, and ask the Chancellor of the Exchequer when we are actually going to catch sight of that money, how much is coming to Scotland uh, and when are we going to get it? Because there is no clarity in that whatsoever. Dr Gohani, Dr Gohani. I think it's quite clear that there's a lot of money coming our way and what we're asking for what we're asking for is for you to promise what we're asking you for is to promise to ring fence it and not fund your pet vanity project. Dr Bilhani, hold on a second. Minister, he's, given, he's taken an intervention. Shouting from a sedentary position is not going to help us get through a debate where we're already tight for time. Dr Bilhani, I can give you some additional time, but not an awful lot. Audit Scotland says a lack of action now presents a serious risk to delivery of care services for individuals. Audit Scotland also points out that the, uh, the SNP Green Government's inability and unwillingness to share information along with a lack of relevant data means there are major gaps in the information needed to inform improvements in social care. And so given the SNP track record when it comes to public sector centralisation, we should all be worried about scrapping local accountability and imposing ministerial control. Let's have a quick look at the record. Botched merger of local police. And in fact, let's look at SNP government's management of big money projects, inquiries into the business case on the governing of Edinburgh Children's Hospital in Glasgow, Queen Elizabeth, where the SNP is responsible for £150 million in cost overrun. The SNP has also made a hash of its adventures in boat craft, the now infamous Calmet project to build two ferries, £150 million over budget, five years late, and now we're told they might not even enter service. Well, I think... No, you can't. You are just about to wind up, Dr. Gohani. Indeed, I am a Deputy Presiding Officer. Kosler is also concerned. Finally, we need to address quality. The current focus on costs has suppressed staff salaries, contributed to high vacancy levels and prioritised the speedy completion of care home visits at the expense of emotional 
care and relationships. We believe in providing the care inspectorate with a wider scope of powers in order to promote sustained improvement of care services over time and to deal with issues which don't meet the high bar of serious risk to life, health or well-being. I move the Scottish Conservatives amendment in my name and I point to members to my register of interest as a practising NHS doctor. Thank you very much indeed. I now call on Alex Cole Hamilton uh, for up to four minutes. Mr Cole Hamilton. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd like to thank my friend Jackie Bailey for tabling this important debate today on an issue that is ignored far too often in this Parliament. There are currently almost 700,000 unpaid carers in Scotland, whilst there are almost 210,000 people working professionally within the Scottish care sector. Combined, carers account for 16% uh, of our overall adult population. That is astonishing. And the services they provide are indispensable. It is estimated that unpaid carers alone contribute a value of £36 billion every single year in Scotland. And despite the positive impact that a carer will have on the person they care for, for their families and their communities, that it is unquantifiable. American professor Leo Buscali has said that it is um, too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, a kind word, a listening ear, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. This is the true value that carers visit on their charges each and every single day. And the ability to soothe, to reinvigorate and to fortify. Families should be able to rest easy knowing that regardless of who is caring for their loved ones, it is someone they can trust and who has the capacity and resources and uh, fortitude to deliver the best standard of care possible. But unfortunately, presiding officer, we know that that is all too often not the case. Our carers are stretched to the point of breaking point. Whilst all carers work unbelievably hard to provide this care, they are simply not given the right support to keep up with those inordinate workloads. At least 15% of the caring workforce regularly work unpaid overtime, whereas unpaid carers are having to go long periods of time without breaks and sacrifice other aspects of their life. We know during the pandemic, during lockdown, that the closure of things like adult respite services only compounded uh, the situation that they find themselves in, all of which put significant strain on carers' health and well-being. And worryingly, despite an act of this Parliament enshrining the rights of those same carers to access support and advice, according to a survey conducted in 2019, only 16% of carers knew that legislation and the rights it provided, and over half of them hadn't even heard of the Carers Act at all. This is why the Scottish Liberal Democrats have campaigned for an update to that Act in light of the pandemic and to actively include carers and service users in the process to build or to better bind lived experience with the legislation that we pass in this chamber. As we have already heard, and as the motion mentions, the cost of living crisis has had a devastating impact on social care and half of unpaid carers across the UK report being unable to afford their monthly household expenses. Meanwhile, professional carers are feeling that their salaries can no longer provide the income and the stability that they sorely need and deserve. The situation is dire. It needs urgent attention. Kevin Stewart would argue that the answer lies in the creation of a so-called national care service. It does not. It does not. Presiding officer, a national care service would strip individuals and local communities of the little agency that they have left. It would put the powers with ministers, the very same ministers, who were responsible for sending untested and COVID-positive patients into our homes, care homes during the foothills of this pandemic. The Scottish Liberal Democrats believe that the answer lies not with centralisation and bureaucracy, but with localism, giving the ability to make decisions to the people most affected by them. This includes working with local government to introduce a package of new carer benefits, a new fund to support training and education for carers returning to work, moving away from narrow work-based contracts to more holistic, flexible roles. All of these are Liberal Democrat policies, ones that could be implemented right now without building complicated and unnecessary structures. So what is the government waiting for? We are legislating on the precipice of a worst crisis in a century. It is our duty to protect the vulnerable and those caring for them, and we must do so urgently. That is why the Scottish Liberal Democrats will support Labour's motion tonight. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Cole Hamilton. We now move to the open debate. I call first uh, Carol Mochan, who will be followed by Gillian Martin. Ms Mochan, for around four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. The cost of living crisis has and continues to impact communities up and down the country. 
And I think at this moment, in this debate, I think we all need to focus on that fact. Just this week, it has been reported that one in five people in Scotland are struggling to pay their weekly food shop, many of whom we understand will be unpaid carers and care workers. One in five people in Scotland. This figure should shame us all. Behind the numbers are stories of family members and key workers struggling to get by and people who provide care to the most vulnerable in our society being unable to make ends meet. This should be a reminder to members of all parties that inaction is not acceptable. Sitting on their hands will not put money in people's pockets. Deputy Presiding Officer, in this debate, I think I need to send a message to the Minister that, by definition, a crisis ought to res be responded to with purpose and with maximum strength, using all available resources. It is not a surprise that the Tories have shown such a lack of political will to assist those most in need. But it is truly shameful that the SNP and the Greens here in this Parliament have not stepped up and supported measures which would offer immediate assistance to people in dire need. But today they have another chance. Today, Scottish Labour heard from carers who are the very best of society, caring for loved ones. And we need now to ensure this Parliament hears them and responds by supporting this motion today. It is fair to say this SNP Government have failed to recognise that this crisis can only be tackled properly through the implementation of ra radical policy here in Scotland as well. In failing to hear this, they have failed our care care carers, paid and unpaid. In the short term time that I have, I want to emphasise that Scottish Labour's motion has importantly highlighted the increased fuel prices that are making it more difficult for care workers to visit the people they support. And I have heard this many times, so I want them to listen. If the Scottish Government wants to join us in reducing the burden placed on care workers, they will support a proposal for increasing mileage reimbursement for care workers by five pence per mile, as agreed for NHS workers. However, Deputy Presiding Officer, we ought not to be surprised by the lack of action thus far. Many of the issues facing social care workers exacerbated by the pandemic, such as low pay and poor working conditions, amongst others, as we have heard, long predate both the pandemic and the current cost of living crisis. Our social care workforce is demoralised and understandably feel as though they have been undervalued, underpaid and overworked for far too long. Scottish Labour's call to immediately end non-residential care charges is an achievable one. We know that. Yet yesterday, in committee, the Minister seemed unable to detail any pro progress on these issues. Despite telling his, us his department is very busy, he only seemed able to outline the poor pay offer that this government um, has offered, an insulting 48 pence increase. Ultimately, this is a minister and a government bereft of ideas on how to support our unpaid carers and social care staff now. Presiding officer, it is clear that action is needed and it is needed urgently. Far too often carers and care workers appear to be forgotten about by government families who use social care are often burdened by high costs and those in care suffer the consequences of poor decision making. In concluding, providing off, presiding officer, far too long the social care workforce has been overworked. And so I call on other parties and I look to the back benches and to the green benches to support this motion this evening, one that values our unpaid carers and social care workforce. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mockin. I now call Gillian Martin to be followed by Sue Webber. And we are going to have to stick strictly to the speaking uh, allocate, time allocations. Up to four minutes, Ms Martin. Thank you, President Officer. Some more than others are feeling the effects of the cost of living crisis, and the walls of this chamber have echoed for weeks and months of, uh, as most of the benches that we talk about are deep worries for those already in poverty and those in work being plunged into poverty. And it is right that Labour are using their debate time to address the impact of this on carers, because it isn't right that people are bearing the cost of doing their job, particularly in relation to mileage remuneration for those who use their own cars. Uh, for their clients. In the face of stratospheric petrol and diesel costs, 
So I'll take one of my constituents. Uh, she's a home carer working in the Aberdeenshire area, getting £10.93 an hour. She's roughly earning about £20,000 a year uh, before tax. Comes from a two-earner household. Her husband's a teacher in Aberdeenshire Secondary School. Enjoys being a carer, fits in with her. Or in fact, she's got three kids to look after as well, and she loves her job. She gets a mileage reimbursement with 35 pence a mile. And she averages about 150 miles a week going to run rural clients in her diesel car. And she's filling up the tank about three times a month. And notice that tank, filling up that tank costs about £15 more than it did even in January. The mileage reimbursement, of course, has stayed the same. And the couple calculate they spend about £90 a month more in their car, car use to do both their respective jobs. And their combined domestic electricity and gas bill has gone up by about £90 too. Their food costs, they reckon, easily up £80 a month. But it's the national insurance rises that are affecting their family income the most. Their teacher husband is seeing an extra £120 coming off his pay packet at source. And all in all, this family estimate they're about £400 worth off, worse off every month. And she says, I'm lucky I've got my husband, he's earning more than me. What if I was on my own? So we're in agreement. This and other carers need help. But where I don't agree with the Labour is where the asks have been made. The, the 12.9 pay increase the Scottish Government facilitated for social care workers is well above inflation and the high highest in these islands. And every move the Scottish Government makes to ease the pressure on low and middle income earners is all but cancelled out by the fiscal irresponsibility to the vast majority of workers and the poorest in our society by decisions made at UK Government level. Jackie K Bailey said, the carers' allowance supplement is wiped out. Wiped out by who? Wiped out by what? Wiped out what happens in Westminster. And yes, the causes of the increased fuel and, uh, fuel and food costs are global. They are in part the outcome of current geopolitics. We're facing the same effects. I haven't got time. Um, the, but they're, we're facing the same effects of the same issues of every other country in that regard. But UK fuel duty is around 40%. Last month's 5% reduction is not enough, and it's not keeping up with fuel price rises. You need to get a windfall tax in operation to all companies profiting from their current situations. Cut VAT on fuel bills now. And I don't have much faith in Conservatives to do the right thing, but I was genuinely, genuinely shocked when Trans Chancellor Rishi Sunak went ahead with a national insurance rise in the face of ordinary people's electricity and gas bills doubling, in the face of huge cost rise of the weekly shop. I don't have time. This is the most regressive tax I have seen since the poll tax. Yet Labour's only answer is for the Scottish Government to mitigate bad decisions by Tories in Westminster at a cost of £600 million a year. £600 million that we could be spending on what? Increasing public sector wages, perhaps? So I say, presiding officer, come on, Labour, for once, for once, turn your fire on those who can act to reduce these tax, fuel and food cost prices at source. Let's make sure that 12.9 increase isn't swallowed up. Let's make sure that we're not relying on Tories whose response to the cost of, cost of living crisis to say that people should just change to supermarket value brands, do more hours, decide to earn more money, or simply sit on buses instead of putting their heating on. Presiding officer. Thank you very much indeed, Ms Martin. I now call on Sue Webber to be followed by Paul McLennan for up to five minutes. Ms Webber. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. There is a crisis in our social care service. Staff are overwhelmed having gone above and beyond during the pandemic, but they have not been given the leadership or the supportive environment that they need from this SNP government. Quite frankly, there's been no leadership at all. But it's not just the SNP who are at fault. Instead of working to address the crisis in social care, Scottish Labour are working with and focused on the centralisation of care services alongside the SNP. This will hollow out local councillors, councils even further. Yes, I will, Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey. If the member isn't aware of what's in the Labour Party manifesto, I would forgive her for that. But if she did read it, she'd understand that it's about local delivery and local accountability. Will she perhaps change what she's just said in light of that factual information? Sue Webber. I think there is the impression that you are still supportive of the National Care Service, and with that I'll carry on with my uh, contribution. The message from service users and those with lived experiences is clear. It is local services that they want. 
It is local services that, they can adapt to the, that can adapt to the diverse nature of the needs. It is these local services and third-party organisations that we should focus on and focus our investment in. They are delivering the services people want. Labour support the plans for a national care service. Despite organisations such as COSLA and the Fraser of Allen Inst Allender Institute voicing serious concerns, the SNP plans amount to a blatant power grab. Costly new legislation and centralised stu structures are not the solution. This is why the Scottish Conservatives would offer a local care service, one which would protect individual choice and individual control. Not at this moment, please. Our local care service would include a local care guarantee, which would ensure that support is delivered as close as possible to those who need it, especially in rural and island communities. We want to see positive action taken. We would give further powers to the Care Inspectorate to drive up standards of local care, a wider scope of powers that should be considered to promote sustained improvement of poor care services over time. We would build minimum pay through terms and conditions into commissioning and procurement as the freely Feely view, review recommended. We would make care a rewarding career path, ensure commission services reward length of service and positive job performance with pay progression and development of skills based and responsibilities. We would institute rigorous workforce planning for the future, a robust, transparent data set to underpin the work that can be developed without a national care service, not merely a workforce plan that was affordable but one based on the forward capacity planning that is carried out by those delivering and accessing the services. On the carers allowance, we would improve the carers allowance and extend payments. We would introduce, do this by introducing a taper rate so that carers do not lose 100% of their allowance if they earn over £1 of the £128 per limit week. We would also extend payments of carers allowance to up to six months after bereavement and allow carers in full-time education to continue to receive the carer's allowance. We would amend the Carers Act to give unpaid carers automatic rights to support breaks from caring, because right now only around 3% of unpaid carers receive statutory support for breaks from caring. The UK Government's health and social care levy delivers a clear dividend a clear union dividend. In 2024 to 25, Scotland will benefit from an additional £1.1 billion because of the health and social care levy. We are calling on the Scottish Government to guarantee that this fund will be passed on and ring-fenced in, in full. While we, the UK government's, while we welcome the UK Government's cut to fuel duty, we consider the mileage reimbursement for care workers should be temporarily increased based on the cost of fuel and, most importantly, funded by the Scottish Government by five pence per mile, as agreed for the NHS workers. Yes, I will. Okay. As briefly wonder, as possible, uh, Minister. Uh, uh, in, in all of this, I wonder if uh, Ms Webber still agrees with what she said last year, uh, which, where she said that um, public sector workers uh, should have a pay, re uh, a pay freeze. Um, and, uh, she thought it may be wise to have a look at a 20 per cent pay cut. Sue, Does she still agree with those Sue comments Weber. from last year? Sue Webber. I think the man Minister is manufacturing a false grievance there. The public want to see us working together, uh, and, my, and I will carry on with my statement this afternoon as I close. Thank you. The UK Government has stepped up during this cost of living crisis, providing a £22 billion package of support, including a cut to fuel duty and an increase to the national insurance thresholds. Instead of pressing ahead with a bureaucratic overhaul of services, the SNP should bring forward reforms now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Webber. I now call on Paul McLennan to be followed by Gillian Mackay for up to four minutes. Mr McLennan. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer. The cost of living crisis is really starting to impact on the most vulnerable in our society. Inflation forecast to reach 10.25%. Fuel poverty expected to double and food bank usage up by 50%. Who can forget the Tory silence on these benches when this Parliament debated the cut in universal credit, impacting the poorest in our society? This Tory silence was, no, I've not got time, was, was replicated in council chambers across Scotland. Now, what makes it even more galling is that across Scotland, Labour and Tory councillors are sitting together over cups of tea, putting council administrations in place. Sterling, East Renfrewshire, South Lanarkshire, and probably more 
are all in the motions of a Labour Tory cosy up. And he's though we even had a Tory candidate turn voters, he was being promised the job of provost by the local Labour Party if they supported a Labour administration. The role, the role of local authorities in delivering social care is of vital importance. Labour going into partnership with Tories in Scotland is a slap in the face to anti-poverty action campaigners. Last night, last night, Scottish Labour tweeted, and I quote, Tonight at Westminster, the Tories Mr. voted McLennan, down the Labour amendment. Mr McLennan, could you resume your seat? Point of order, Daniel Johnson. I am wondering if you could uh, remind the Chamber of what the standing orders say regarding speaking to the motion at hand uh, in a given debate. I listened to the, the, the speech. That it, it has roamed a little further from the, the text, but, but it is, it, he has referenced, the member has referenced the uh, relationship to local authorities delivering these services. So, Mr McLennan, would you please resume? Thank you, Deputy President Officer. And I do reference the social care and the cost of living crisis. And I want to go, last night, Scottish Labour tweeted, and I quote, Thank you at Westminster, the Tories voted down a Labour amendment calling for a windfall tax on oil and gas giants. Now, this is the best part. Make no mistake, the nasty party is back. Across council chambers in Scotland, we see Scottish Labour keeping the bed warm for Tories. The Scottish Labour Party prefer working with what they call the nasty party. No, I'm sorry. No, I'm not factually wrong. I'll give, Jackie Bailey, I'll give you the opportunity. If you, I'll give way to you if you want to stand up and tell us... Mr the McLennan, please resume your seat. Craig Hoy, point of order. I suggest that Mr McLennan has come to the wrong debate, and I suggest that he retakes his seat and comes back to the debate with this, clear, this speech has clearly been written for. Not a point of order. Mr McLennan, please resume. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. They, they, don't hear, they don't like what they're hearing. They don't like what they're hearing. I'll give way to Jackie... I will give way to Jackie Bailey if she can stand up and say Labour won't go into administration with Tory colleagues. Jackie Bailey. I'd like to sit down. I'm happy to intervene on you. Perhaps you might reflect on um, Eastern Bartonshire. Could you maybe tell me what's going on in Eastern Bartonshire? Through the Is chair, there a collaboration? please, Ms Bailey. Sorry, through the chair. Of course, of course. Is there a collaboration going on there between, let me guess, the SNP and Labour? Would you care to reflect on that? And other councils that are similarly having those discussions, would you care to name those, perhaps? Mr McLennan. Question, Jackie Bailey. <laughs> the Scottish Government has, in the last year, raised pay twice for social care staff. Kevin Stewart laid out other measures in his speech. In April this year, the minimum hourly rate for the providing uh, adult social care increased to £10.50 per hour. That was a rate of increase of 4.8% from the £10.02 pence rate that was introduced in December, an increase of 12.9% for those workers in the course of a year. For a full-time adult social care worker based on 37 and a half hours, this increase simply did an uplift of £1,600 over the course of the financial year. The £10.50 hourly rate in Scotland is also significantly higher than the national living wage, uh, living wage rate, which will apply to many social care workers in England and Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland with workers receiving less than £1 an hour than in Scotland. The National Care Service is the most ambitious reform of public services since the creation of the NHS and will be established as the Minister said, by the end of the current parliamentary term. With the creation of the National Care Service, we can take forward national pay bargaining, bargaining with the social care sector for the first time. The carers' allowance supplement was also the first payment made by Social Security Scotland and increased carers' allowance by 13 per cent, with eligible carers receiving a payment of £231 every six months. In December last year, eligible carers received a double carers' allowance supplement of £462 in recognition of the additional pressures that they have faced as a result of the pandemic. Presiding officer, in conclusion, how can anyone take Labour seriously over the cost of living crisis? They are holding hands with the architects of the cost of living crisis. The message is loud and clear. Vote Labour, get the Tories, get the nasty party. Thank you. Thank you, Mr McLennan. Uh, we now have absolutely no time left over the course of not just this debate, but the um, subsequent debate. Uh, so I'm going to have to require members to stick absolutely to their time, whether or not they take interventions. Uh, Gillian Mackay to be followed by Alec Rowley. Up to four minutes, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As many others have, I would like to begin by thanking all social care workers and unpaid carers for everything they do. As I am the co-convener of the CPG on carers, I will focus on the impact of the cost of living crisis on unpaid carers. At CPG meetings, I have heard firsthand how unpaid carers and those they care for have been affected. Many have been experiencing rising costs against a backdrop of a global pandemic. 
during which they have been worried about the effect of COVID-19 on their loved ones, while also coping with the impact of taking on more care on their own mental health and physical health. As we know, COVID resulted in some people's care packages being reduced or withdrawn, and it often fell to unpaid carers to fill in the gaps. Research published in 2020 showed an estimated 392,000 additional people in Scotland have become unpaid carers as a result of the pandemic, bringing the total number of carers in Scotland to around 1.1 million. The cost of living crisis will have a disproportionate impact on unpaid carers, many of whom face significant financial hardship because of their caring role. Research recently published by Carers Scotland revealed that 92 per cent of those carers surveyed had seen their energy bills increase, and two-thirds were already cutting back on heating. There may be additional costs associated with caring. Carers often find themselves paying for items to keep those they care for well and safe, such as PPE, cleaning supplies and equipment. And according to Carers Scotland, Carers Report, these costs have risen in the past six months. There may also be additional energy costs associated with running electrical equipment. If the person is being cared for has mobility issues, they may spend more time in the house and therefore have higher energy consumption. This also applies to people who are receiving palliative care at home. Recent Marie Curie and Loughborough University research highlighted that the double burden of income loss and increased cost of living expenditure brought on by a terminal illness, such as higher energy bills and home adaptations, can leave people struggling to, meet, to make ends meet. All of these factors must be taken into account when we consider the impact of the cost of living crisis on carers and the level of support required. Contrary to the, the advice that was recently offered by a certain UK minister, people, especially carers, cannot simply work more hours or move to a better paid job to offset rising costs. Caring, which is often in itself a full-time job, impacts un -carers, uh, unpaid carers' ability to take up paid employment. According to Carers Scotland, six in ten of those who care for 35 hours or more a week are not in paid employment. I fully support the call within the Government Amendment for the UK Government to take forward an emergency budget to address the cost of living crisis and increasing fuel costs, including its impact on unpaid carers. We need to see action on this now because people are struggling now and have been for some time. I really do not have time, I am sorry. Carers Scotland have warned that, as well as the financial impact, the cost of living crisis is having an increasing impact on their mental and physical health, with 80 per cent reporting that they feel stressed, anxious and worried about the steps they would need to take to manage their current finances. The greatest impact is often felt by those who are full-time carers. We must deliver a right for unpaid carers to be supported to take breaks from caring as part of the National Care Service as a matter of urgency and to make sure that these breaks address the multitude of caring responsibilities that some people have. I look forward to the publication of the Scottish Government's carer strategy and sincerely hope that it will set out clear actions that can be taken to improve support for unpaid carers across Scotland. Unpaid carers should be recognised as equal partners in care. Our social care system would collapse without them and the support they provide is worth more than £10.9 billion to the Scottish economy each year. It is vital that we recognise that and we do thank them for their efforts, but they need more than warm words and applause. They need to see action on the cost of living crisis and improve support, which helps them to care for their own mental and physical health, as well as that of those they care for. Thank you very much, Ms Mackay. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Christine Graham. Up to four minutes, Mr Rowley. President Officer, when I read the SNP amendment this morning, I have to say that I just felt despair, because either the Minister and his party are unwilling to recognise the key issues in social care, or you just do not know how to fix them. And that, that gives me real concern. But more importantly, I think it must give the tens of hundreds of people up and down Scotland, older people who either are trapped in hospital because they can't get a care package, or sitting in their houses and they can't get a care package, they've been assessed, or they're sitting on waiting lists for assessment. And as usual, the, the, the Minister and indeed the SNP government refer their answer to being the set up of a national care service. But I would remind Mr Stewart and the government that Stephen Boyle the Auditor General, when he appeared in front of the Audit Committee some weeks ago, was very clear. He said some things cannot wait for the establishment of a national care service. In a minute, and I am absolutely clear 
that the appalling terms and conditions of workers working in the private sector delivering a public service cannot wait years because we're talking years. If you bring forward if you bring forward and publish a bill before the summer, then the time that gets through and then the implementation time, whatever we come up with, we're talking years. This cannot wait. Briefly, Minister. For giving way, and we are not going to uh, wait until the establishment of the National Care Service to make progress in terms of pay and terms and conditions. And that's why I will continue to talk to COSLA, the unions, and other partners to see what progress we can make on that front. Alec Rowley. Thank you. That whole point, though, is that you have. Two sets of workers, both delivering a public service, a valuable public service to vulnerable people. You have one set of workers on pay terms and conditions that are completely different from the other. You have social carers, mostly women, going out there. They could put in an eight-hour shift and find themselves being paid five hours for that shift because they did not get paid for going between the, the contracts. And that is down to because the Council contracts out these services, and in effect, what we are seeing in Scotland is social care on the cheap. Now, I acknowledge that there are, there are powers that, that I would support in terms of being able to look at employment law, but you do not need those powers to address this problem. And that is, that is the fallacy that you continually put across. You have the powers in Scotland right now. You could say to every Through the chair, please, Mr. Rowley. in the country that sorry. Through the chair, please, Mr. Rowley. Sorry, Mr. Stewart and the government has the powers right now. They could tomorrow fix this issue by putting the resources into health and social care. And I say to you, you cannot wait year after year after year. This is fixable, and it's fixable now. Now. For many people, I heard Paul, Paul McClellan talk about a national care service and similar terms to the creation of a national health service. But if you read the SNP motion, it talks about a national care service with ethical commissioning. Get rid of the commissioning. What about not-for-profit public services delivered to people free at the point of need? I think once the public in Scotland get their heads round what you're proposing here, a privatised care service that's not going to work, then you're in for a shock. Thank you, Mr Rowley. I now call on Christine Graham, who will be the final speaker in the open debate for up to four minutes. Ms Graham. Uh, thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Obviously, I will reprise some of the arguments already put at this late stage of the debate. First, as others, may I wholeheartedly pay tribute and thanks to all carers professional, paid and unpaid, their commitment to those they care for and the kindness, which is essential, with which it is delivered must never be overlooked or underestimated. I turn to the Labour motion. COVID has indeed exposed the failings and deficiencies across the care sector, right across it, but to particularly in the care home sector, and reform is now a necessity. Hence, the Scottish Government is committed to a national care service, but I agree that is for the future, and we must face the here and now. First, there is the issue of recruitment. Two factors, at least, are in operation here. Brexit, which the Labour motion sidesteps, and pay levels. Now, in the public sector, the Scottish Government can and has taken action. Adult social care workers and commission services in Scotland had the minimum hourly rate increased by over 10 per cent to £10.50 an hour in the last year. But that is in the public sector. And I say to Alec Rowley, very sympathetic though I am, and I heard what he had to say about employment legislation. I hope he's meaning this should come to the Scottish Parliament. Mm -hmm. We have no control over the private sector, nor the contracts and the terms and conditions. All that we can do is try to persuade. Yes, I will. Jackie Bailey. Brief. I'm very grateful. Um, the government, the Scottish government, already top up the wages of care workers in the private sector. So the truth is, there is nothing to stop them from doing this now about mileage rates. Christine Graham. I, I would like Jackie B. Bailey to take on board this fact, and I'm a socialist like you. I don't like putting money into the private sector to beef up 
the profits and the returns to shareholders. That is the issue here. They are still getting money out of looking for after people in profits, and that is not what I want to see. And we cannot interfere with individual contracts of different companies. So I welcome a movement towards employment law coming here. Now, I am going to move on in a very short time. I knew this would happen. Pay is not the only thing there must be for people in the care sector. I want to see career progression. So if those wish to transition from the care sector to the nursing profession can do that, if that's what the individual wishes. Now, according to Queen Margaret University, you can have direct entry, for example, into a nursing course and have accelerated entry into a Master of Nursing degree year two if you meet certain requirements. Now, I'm not saying for one moment that one profession is superior to the other. They are different but complementary, but it does allow people to see if they wish a career progression, which is important to all of us. Now, in terms of the crisis that we're in, when the Governor of the Bank of England refers to apocalyptic food prices, I don't know what planet Sandesh Gilhani is on, because the Governor of the Bank of England is not known for hyperbole apocalyptic rise in the cost of living. And that touches more on people who are stuck at home, either paid carers or unpaid carers, when they may have ventilators, they have heating, they have laundry, they have everything else to deal with, who are having enormous prices. So we do need, I am in my last minute, we do need an emergency budget here and now to deal with these factors. Tinkering, tinkering the edges is not good enough. And I say and finally to the Labour benches, mitigation is what we are doing in here all the time for a Tory government with only six MPs elected to Westminster. We mitigate all the time. I have had enough of mitigation. £770 million this year so far mitigating this. I do not like to choose between the worthy and the less worthy. We should not be having to do that. We should be independent, dealing with these issues here and now, dealing with our economy, having a proper benefit system, and never, ever have to suffer Tory austerity yet again. Thank you, Ms. Graham. We now move to the wind-up speeches. Um, I am disappointed to note that Alex Cole-Hamilton, uh, who participated in the debate earlier, is not in his seat. We will expect an explanation for that. I now call uh, Craig Hoy, though, for up to four minutes, please, Mr. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I am pleased to have this opportunity to close the debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Uh, we heard some very good uh, and frank uh, contributions in this debate, and we heard the contribution uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, McLennan. But as many members noted, I want to express uh, my tremendous gratitude towards everyone in the social care system, to thank them for everything that they have done throughout the pandemic and everything that they will go on to do. And I also want to thank those unpaid carers who, as Alex Cole Hamilton said, who said, and I now see he has resumed his seat, um, provide an unquantifiable level uh, of support in Scotland across all ages, some very young and many over 65. They are unsung heroes and they need our support. A recent report from Audit Scotland paints a picture of a social care service in crisis in Scotland. Staff are not adequately valued, engaged or rewarded. And as Jackie Bailey said, it is simply unacceptable that now some are subsidising their employers. It is now an industry undermined by long hours, low pay and poor recognition. And this is a position that has made, been made worse as a result of the global cost of living crisis. And this, in turn, is contributing to recruitment difficulties, rising sickness, absence and high vacancy levels. And this ultimately puts the people who require care services at risk. And as Alex Rowley said, urgent action is required to address the needs of carers and to address uh, social care problems, which are pushing the industry towards disintegration and collapse. But what is the SNP government's proposed solution? To create a national care service, which, according to COSLA, amounts to an attack on localism, and judging by Mr Stewart's remarks today, will also amount to an attack on private sector providers. Make no mistake, the SNP are providing sticking plasters today uh, while they rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic tomorrow, because past experience shows us that centralisation can be costly and chaotic and will put additional pressures on hard-pressed carers. And instead of pressing ahead with this bureaucratic overhaul of services, the SNP should bring forward reforms now 
and let the record fund, uh, funding that they have received from the UK Government flow towards Scotland's councils. But according to COSLA, local government revenue funding has decreased by 20% in real terms between the years 2013 and 2022, and Labour calls for the removal of non-residential care services. This is a laudable goal, but this is something that the SNP would need to fund in order to replace the lost revenues for councils. But the, council, but the current policy frame, framework on charging for social care support at home is not, uh, it's not presently accessible. It is far from transparent, it is far from fair, and it is far from equitable. Debate, today's debate has been instructive in helping us to understand the scale of the problems following a care service. But the SNP's amendment is anything but helpful. Once again, Mr Stewart seeks to pass the buck. The SNP does what it always does, dodges responsibility for problems, for the recruitment and retention and the care crisis in Scotland today. No, I, I won't give way. But on this and on so many other issues, this Government adopts a cynical strategy, an ABC approach, A, abdicate responsibility, B, blame Brexit and C, say Covid is the cause. But up and down the country, carers and care workers can see through it. They know that the problems of recruitment, of retention, of staff burnout and a postcode lottery in social care all predate the pandemic. Ministers repeatedly ignored the concerns of those working in the care sector and of the army of unpaid carers. This is a crisis for which the SNP and the SNP alone is to blame. The government had a decade to fix the roof when the sun was shining and they systematically failed to do so. And that's why I encourage colleagues to support the Conservative motion this evening. Thank you, Mr Hoy. I now call on the Minister uh, for up to four minutes, uh, Mr Stewart. Uh, well, President Officer, I think that uh, those that work in the care profession and unca uh, unpaid carers uh, can see through the Tory spin here today, because at the heart of the difficulties that we have throughout these islands is the fact that we have an impotent Prime Minister and Chancellor who are unable to fix uh, this cost of living crisis where other countries have stepped up to the plate uh, in order to do so. And I'll listen to what Mr Hoy has to say. It might Briefly, be Mr Hoy. The Minister suggests that the UK Government is impotent. Might he say how many Scots will pay a lower rate of national insurance, a lower, lower amount of national insurance, after the Chancellor's come, uh, effect, uh, cut comes into effect in a few months' time? Minister. What I'll say is a huge amount of Scots are paying much more in national insurance. Uh, they will be paying much more uh, in terms of costs for petrol, for electricity, for gas, for food shopping, because you have an impotent... Prime Minister and Chancellor who are unable to do what other countries are doing and help out the poorest in society through these tough times. And I think the other interesting point uh, in Mr Hoy's summing up there was he called care an industry. An industry. Well, this is not an industry. This is about supporting and caring for our most vulnerable, not an industry at all. And, and let me take uh, umbrage with the Tory benches in terms of pay, because they say that we should be paying more, uh, and this government will make the efforts to ensure uh, that we do better in pay and conditions as we move on. But we pay more here than south of the border, more than in Labour-controlled Wales. And when will the Tories recognise that we could do even more if his Chancellor loosened the purse strings and actually paid folks south of the border a decent rate and we gained the consequentials from that? So no hypocrisy will I take from the Tory benches on this issue. Um, and let me show uh, to the chamber, uh, say to the chamber, some of the actions that we have taken. Um, we have waived the cost of PGV, uh, PVG checks and Scottish uh, Social Services Council registration. We have funded um, My Job Scotland recruitment to try and bring more folk into the social care profession, not industry, profession. Uh, and we will continue to do all that we can to try and ensure that we fill those vacancies. But let's look at what we have been up against. Brexit. Brexit. One service I spoke to 
lost 40 per cent of their workforce because of Brexit. Yet another Tory failure. We believe that Scotland's social care services benefit greatly from staff from across the world who join the workforce through international recruitment. And shame on the Tories for blocking uh, these folks out uh, of uh, these islands. And I have to say, uh, President Officer, uh, that in a number of other areas, we are ahead uh, of other parts of the country, and we would always want to be in a position to do more. So let's look um, at uh, some of the things that we are doing differently in terms of the carers' allowance supplement, which we uplifted uh, by 6%, along with other benefits. Uh, this is an investment of £4.6 million in 2023, uh, aimed at supporting those on low incomes, particularly families and unpaid carers who are suffering at this moment. And we will. No, the Minister is just about to conclude because he's already over his time. Uh, in which case, uh, President Officer, uh, I will conclude in these points. And we will continue to do our utmost for our social care workforce for that social care profession and for unpaid carers in our country as we move on. And I think, lastly, President Officer, you know, the Labour Party and us agree on a number of things. I think one of the key elements that they seem to forget is the fact that we are bound by a restriction in powers. You need to conclude. Would be better attacking the Tories today rather than these Thank ministers. you, Minister. I now call on Paul O'Kane to wind up for up to five minutes. Mr O'Kane. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And we have heard in this chamber today the reality of how carers uh, are coping in these immensely difficult times. And of course, these benches put on record our thanks to carers, both paid and unpaid, up and down our country, who are supporting people day in and day out, especially during this cost of living crisis. But it's clear, Deputy Presiding Officer, that carers are being let down. In the absence of a social care system that properly supports the needs of everybody, unpaid carers in particular have had to step up where this government has simply failed. We know from estimates by third sector organisations that during lockdown, up to an additional 400,000 Scots took on unpaid caring roles, bringing the number of unpaid carers in Scotland to over a million. And the impacts of this have been devastating. Two thirds of carers have reported uh, acute worsening of their mental health and wellbeing due to the lack of support. And I think we heard that articulated by many colleagues, uh, including uh, Alec Cole Hamilton. And whilst the pandemic has brought these problems to the fore, they are by no means new. We know that unpaid carers, care workers and people with diverse and complex care needs have been let down over 15 years of an SNP government. And the problem has now reached a breaking point with the twin challenges of the pandemic and the worst cost of living crisis in living memory, highlighted by so many colleagues this afternoon, but in particular my colleague Carol Mockin. The SNP have had 15 years to show our social care workforce how valued they are. And yet now, as the NHS struggles to remobilise, the SNP government has failed to show that they recognise just how crucial the work of our social care services is and the unparalleled work that both paid and unpaid carers do. And we've had a shopping list of strategies and reviews from the Minister today. We've had the National Care Service proposals yet again, trumpeted as the silver bullet, which is four years down the road. The creation of a National Care Service cannot be an excuse to delay reforms and improvements to care now. Many of the recommendations identified in the Feely report are yet to be delivered. The Minister and his colleagues are using their vision of a National Care Service, a vision which we do have concerns about, as an excuse for doing nothing now, and that is unacceptable. And the Minister is, of course, quick to pin the failure to fix the staffing crisis in social care on Brexit. But let's be clear, Brexit did not cause the staffing crisis in social care. It exposed and exacerbated that crisis, which was driven by the SNP's failure to acknowledge low wages and poor terms and conditions. The SNP amendment today talks about the UK government delivering an emergency budget. Let's be absolutely crystal clear. No party has done more to challenge this out-of-touch Tory government than the Labour Party. But again, again, the SNP want to pass the buck. Let's be clear that it took the SNP months and two attempts to join Labour in the division lobbies and vote for a windfall tax that will put money in the pockets of care workers. The First Minister has the power to support carers and care workers. 
but she refuses to do more. And if the Greens decide today to commit themselves to the SNP's amendment, that will be a complete betrayal of the manifesto that they stood on. Because this is a party who promised to give social care workers a £15 an hour rise and then rolled back once the First Minister came calling. So we will be clear at decision time and supporting using the powers of this Parliament to make a real difference for carers. And the Conservatives today, while saying that they are showing their concern in the Chamber for carers, with their amendment, they failed to propose solutions that would help carers, such as calling for an immediate rise to £12 an hour for care workers. And once again last night, they showed their true colours in the House of Commons when they would not support our moves for a windfall tax. So as the pressure on our social care services continues to intensify, the burnout of carers and care workers uh, is increasing. We're seeing hostile work practices. We're seeing one in five workers currently on insecure or temporary contracts, with an additional 15 per cent of staff regularly working unpaid overtime. And without a fresh approach to the training, retention and proper pay of staff, uh, we risk losing our skilled social care workforce altogether. Scottish Labour has pledged to fight for a fair wage for all paid care staff, as well as quality training opportunities. And we must see the waiver of the Scottish Social Services Council registration fee become permanent. And it is clear that we must do more to support workers in travelling to work and between work. And it is clear that we must do something on mileage. And I would say to Gillian Martin, what is the point of this Parliament if we do not use the powers of this place to protect people like the carers that she speaks about? Today, before this debate, along with my colleague Jackie Bailey, I met unpaid carers who are struggling day after day with this cost of living crisis. The families I met told me today that household bills have risen by £4,000. That is, quite frankly, unthinkable and frightening. Unpaid carers are not receiving the support they need to make sure that they can keep their homes warm and their families safe and secure. And in concluding, presiding officer, it is clear across this chamber we must show that we value unpaid carers and care staff and Scottish Labour will always be on their side and I call on the chamber to back our motion tonight. Thank you. That concludes the debate on supporting carers during the cost of living crisis. It is now time to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 4445 in the name of Michael Mara on protecting attainment funding. I will allow a moment or two 